All right, welcome everyone. I'm Zach with Passive House Accelerator. Thanks for being here for Construction Tech Tuesday. Uh, we're really excited to have David Arnott from the TAG panels uh, here to dive deeper into uh, prefab work. Um, great follow-up from yesterday's program. So Passive House Accelerator is a collaborative online platform for sharing innovation and thought leadership in Passive House design and construction. We publish articles and interviews. We produce weekly virtual confabs uh, with Passive House pioneers around the world, including today's Construction Tech and tomorrow's Global Passive House Happy Hour, yesterday's summit. And uh, we're just, we're very happy to have you here. Um, Construction Tech Tuesdays is something that we produce with our co-hosts, Sean St. Amour, Kevin Brennan, and Mark Willey. And this is uh, meant to share the technical, the technique, and the technology of Passive House Construction Tech. So each week, we'll welcome guest practitioners to dive into the details of practice with the builder and tradesperson as our target audience. We welcome folks from all corners of the construction and design world to join us each week. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks, everyone. I'm Kevin Brennan. I'm one of your hosts. Uh, tonight, we have an excellent episode that Sean has pulled together with uh, with tag panels. Uh, their presentation last night was was great, but it was a, I wanted more. I wanted to see more. Uh, so just a little reference about my background back here. Uh, if you weren't on the call earlier, this is an infrared uh, image from a, a project that we worked on in Brooklyn. And uh, take your infrared images and send them to us and uh, get them out there. They're great marketing. The picture on the that you can see here, the white windows, there, there's double pane windows. And then we have triple pane windows on the other ones up there. So this is a non-certified passive house. The blower door test came in at 0.77 at triple pane windows. So it's a really great project. Uh, so let's get it out there and uh, I'll pass the mic to Sean. Well, just before we do that, Mark, what did, what did Kevin just deliver? What did he just talk about? What were those three things that he just spoke about? Uh, I, I, I think he said passive house accelerator. Were those the three things? Yes, but then there were some T words that he mentioned. What were those T words, Mark? I, I would refer to them as, uh, I mean, just off the cuff, I don't, I'm grabbing at straws here, but they could be technical, technique, and technology. Am I close? You're bang on, my friend. And we're here on Tuesday. Uh, great to have Kevin and Mark here. They will uh, come back in a few minutes once I've beaten up uh, Dave talking about some of his details um, to critique and comment. And then we will dive into questions. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I will do my best to uh, pull them out between the banter of all the, the jokes that uh, Mark puts on there and uh, random facts that he is so customary on, on putting into the chat. Um, so put your questions in there and we will get to them um, shortly. So let me pull up my presentation here without... And, 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 and Sean, while you pull that up, um... We want everyone uh, to in the chat. Please, please share with us where you're, uh, where you're, where you're, where you're at tonight. I know you have it in your name, uh, but it's it's nice to see your ready list in the chat. And um, anyone who puts their location in the chat will get a free uh, free link to to Wednesday's Global uh, Passive House Happy Hour. So uh, please, please do that and you'll get the free link. Thank you. We like giving out free stuff. So you'll, you'll get that. Okay, uh, you guys know that you're here for the construction uh, tech. So last week we um, didn't announce this, but again, you've seen it. We've got Mr. David Arnett with us from Stark Architect. Um, nothing like getting a photo off the internet of somebody with their face dirty. So luckily he's cleaned himself up for today. Um, and, but David is, is, has been in Passive House for a while here. And, and I'm going to go through most of the presentation and I'm going to get him to comment on a few things. Let me just get that icon out of the way. Um, Dave and I actually first got to work together on the Icebox Challenge. If you're familiar, about three years ago, City of Vancouver wanted to showcase and promote the Passive House standard. And so put out a design competition that, um, that I would say David easily won, even though there was four other teams that he uh, he did beat out um, to create two boxes that mimicked the local mountains. Um, and I'll comment a little bit later of, of the builder who built them may, may need to 
talk to David about um, some building skills. Two recent projects that um, that Stark's been involved in is the first commercial passive house in Revelstoke and this cabin that is a CLT and, um, and, and all the lovely details. So two beautiful projects. And so David's been involved with Passive House for many years and uh, decided to connect with some um, fine gentlemen to create a prefab company. And so here we are, we've got tag panels. Um, David, you wanna just speak briefly about this, you know, how fast you guys have moved in the last year to get this thing up and up and running? Yeah, um, so tag panels was really set up as a solution to there not being enough um, prefab companies in the certainly in the sea to sky. Um, Stark had done a project with a previous prefab company in 2016, um, and there was a couple of things lacking from that. Uh, what we felt was that you know, you can be too far in one net zone, you can be too into the technical side, you can be too, side, too into the construction side and too into the design side. So we wanted to set one up where um, the three partners are an architect, uh, an engineer and a contractor. And uh, through the, the three contacts there, we have, you know, 150 jobs coming in every year and almost every one of them is struggling to build a house in a tight window, usually within a um, you know, a, a May to November window. And we were tired from years and years of seeing these beautiful high performance builds sitting out in the rain. Um, and then all the callbacks from them and seeing guys tarp roofs and try and torch roof snow, you know, under the snow. So yeah, we, we formed tag panels um, and we've grown rapidly from a 3000 square foot facility to the 10,000 one that you see there. Um, and yeah, it's been, it, been an interesting journey so far but we've just been amazed by the response there's such a market for this no it's it's great to see how fast it, it has grown i know i'd say the step code is a real driver here in bc um having having to push the high performance and step code um we're you know through through stark we're seeing step four houses that we're designing and we're finding contractors stick framing them and then they fail their first floor door test at you know 1.5 air changes an hour they hit a three they're good builders, they're really, really good, but they're struggling with poly and electricians ripping everything apart. And it's just everything that we, we know is a problem. And then we had one in particular who spent $24,000 in labor running around with Colt guns and smoke machines and multiple blower door tests. And I had a client a couple of weeks ago, they actually did eight blower door tests to try and isolate these areas. So. The panels are just a kind of, we don't want to reinvent the wheel here. We just want to give guys the simplest tool. And when you've got a sheet of plywood with one layer of tape on it, it's a pretty easy way to get an airtight assembly. And again, if we follow our three T's, I just wanted to talk about technology. And, and I mean, it's great that these guys are building the panels. And so, yes, you have a design team um, that are kind of up in the rafters in their office building, but you guys can connect right on the shop floor and be able to zoom in on details. And so if there's something that the team is building on the floor, you already have this digital twin. And I think this digital twin phrase, again, I stole it from uh, one of Mark's uh, shows and, and Dave's shows a couple weeks ago where, you know, you've pre-designed it, you've pre-built it, and now you can figure out all those little details in 3D. We're like, oh, am I supposed to put a piece of block in here? Am I supposed to, you know, do some detail? You have that digital twin. And I think that's just, you know, fascinating on, on and how to make this thing work better. Yeah, absolutely. There's a shared model. So, and everything's modeled within it. You can see here, you can see even the hangers and the connections and different structural beams. And the guys love that on the shop because they do get detailed shop drawings, but there's nothing better than seeing like a 3D model and wheeling around it. And again, when we have contractors come through, they're just amazed because they all recognize that this is a process that they would have to do on site in the rain while someone's trying to deliver something else and while they're cutting things. And then the, the clients don't realize that the clients end up paying for that at the end in overages and just uh, errors. So, yeah. Yeah, no, really cool to see again that the technology is brought right to the factory floor and have these, you know, real in-depth 3D discussions with uh, the image up. Okay, so here's kind of the process. Um, David, you want to kind of go through the five stages? 
Yeah, so <clears throat> first stage is just uh, getting architectural and structural drawings um, at a kind of you know design development stage. Enough information on the structurals to indicate where all the PSLs and the headers are because that kind of factors into the price quite a lot. And then we work usually nowadays with an energy modeler who will assess because we're doing whole energy models, they will have a required R value that we need to hit. So we're finding that most more often than not, our two by eight wall uh, exceeds that. Then the project goes into the modeling stage and that's really a collaborative effort with the architect and the engineer and the contractor. And we work out a lot of details and you'd be, as an architect, you know, I'll freely admit that we don't fully coordinate all the drawings. It might, you know, we might make it sound like we do, but we don't. And so you see the clash detections and that's such a powerful thing again for saving those, you know, unfactored in costs on site. Uh, we then move into a shop drawing phase and that uh, is a detailed set of drawings with cut lists, everything on them. They get go down to the shop floor. Uh, the guys take about 20 days to build a 4,000 square foot house on average and it gets loaded up into trucks and then we take it to site and then we actually send a crew to install it and we're working with contractors now to kind of use their help if we can and kind of educate them because it's not rocket science but uh it does need a little bit of a sort of helping hand as to how these go together and, and david i'll come back to the shop drawings because i think this is quite important like um you know one thing about prefab is the fact that builders on site are having to do shop drawings in their head or you know in in using 2d drawings to figure out their materials and so forth and this is like just being put out from the software and, and it's it's pretty easy for it but it, it also helps out connecting with steel manufacturers and trust manufacturers other people that might be not part of the initial package but are part of the full design you guys are able to offer um you know to help out giving the right uh, measurements to these yeah. other manufacturers absolutely like we're learning from every job and even now we've implemented that we have a third party steel modeler and they will model all of the steel to integrate into our model we've done some jobs where it's been done by a different steel person and the model doesn't integrate and then we get problems on site and then the other great thing about the sh shop drawings is because the cut lists are exact measurements and we can then order our materials in, you know, eight foot or 10 foot. We don't just order 14 foots and then cut them down as you might do on site. Uh, so our waste bin at the end of each project is the size, you know, it's, it's minimal. Whereas on site, you'll see construction fires and people trying to get rid of waste lumber. Um, and especially with lumber doubling in price, it's been an asset. Um, and even that too, you guys have a, a bin at the end of the line for even your scrap membranes. And I actually grabbed a bunch because I'm going to wrap Christmas presents with it. So uh, <laughs> thank you for keeping your waste. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I always make the joke that uh, one of my kids is going to get the high performance tape for her gifts and she's going to take a while for her to open it because yeah. I love her so much. <laughs> yeah. So if we get into the technical, uh, you know, wall panels or wall panels, you're either building it on the floor or you're, you know, building it on a, on a job site. So the difference is, is the fact that you've added two extra steps to this. You've got the structure built, then you put on the, the membranes and then you've done the insulation. So your panels are giving, are getting three very important components all in one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You've got the interior air barrier there you see as the plywood, which is taped. So you can see these are large sort of uh, four by eight panels with the blue tape uh, sealing them. And then they're insulated inside the factory in between the two by eights. And then we wrap them with a Gutex uh, wood fiber and then the membrane wraps in. And then here you can see a kind of window opening. So we've actually got the sill uh, taped in well and all of the membranes tape on in inside so you've got a very sort of continuous and tight hair barrier and again the guy that's involved in tape tape doesn't always like water so in our climate it's it's quite important um i, I pulled up this photo when i was at the shop just because again it's the uh a roof cassette um but there's a lot of really cool details in here do you want to go into it and, and i'll maybe pinpoint some other ones that i thought were pretty pretty significant yeah so this is for a house in house in whistler with a sloped uh roof and it meets in the middle onto a steel beam so the angles you see here are going to be um, bolted on, like nailed on site onto the uh, steel beam. So we have to pack around that and then we have to hold the top Gutex back from that to allow them to connect in. Then we'll stuff that with rock sole and then clad over with more wood fiber and then kind of seal it all in. But this is the sort of 
some of these hangers, they require 20 nails per hanger. And when we're doing this in a dry shop and you're doing this on the ground at waist height, the guys, I'm not going to say they love it, but they, it's great. Whereas they would have to be up two levels of scaffolding, hovering underneath the steel beam while it's raining with this beam, with, with this panel, which can weigh up to 3,000 pounds hanging above them, trying to nail in 20 nails per hanger. So again, it's these kind of invisible efficiencies that sometimes it's hard to explain to a client, um, but doing this dry in a shop at waist level is much, much better. Yeah, and I just like the little details here again is on the eye joist, you've had to put in some blocking to put in the piece of plywood to ensure you don't get blow to the cellulose. So like that panel or that that section of that's getting insulation, it's getting a full pack and not having any, you know, any miscellaneous stuff for blowout. So it's, uh, yeah. it's pretty cool. And, and, and can you imagine having poly underneath this and trying to tack it around all this sort of stuff, whereas the a lower level of plywood is your air barrier? much nicer. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Um, so again, here's the factory space. And so this is kind of an interesting view because yes, you know, the carpenters in here, but the carpenters have had to learn a little bit of kind of industrial engineering because they've had to figure out how to get things moved around the factory and then loading it on a, on a trailer. So now they've got their Lego kits and trying to figure out again, okay, we've now built it. Did we build it in the right sequence so we can now offload it in the right way? Yeah, there's a lot of pre-planning. Uh, yeah, as Sean said, we kind of we have to build everything backwards, so because the last panel off is the last one we we install. And yeah, I think anyone who's on who's a builder or a carpenter, I mean, these guys are so open to this new new way of doing things, and the care they take in their normal work is really showing here when we start to say that we have to lay the panels carefully and we have to wrap everything and you know seal really tight it's it's been really amazing to see them kind of just step up and really kind of own this process and they have to have a much more holistic view of making the panel whereas some generals would subcontract a framer the framer comes in does their work as fast as you like and gets out of there and then the membrane crew or the insulation crew they're great as well but if they come across a problem it's it's kind of like a well, whose option is it to fix that? Whereas here, the panels go out finished, so it's on us to make sure everything's wrapped in. And that kind of overlap, again, is a kind of, you know, a real benefit of this sort of system. Oh, great. Okay, so let's go to a job site. So here's, again, a view of, of you know, the site going on. So we can now get into the technique. So here's a project in Whistler where you guys supplied the walls. Um, then there was uh, a steel fabricator involved, and then the trusses were brought in afterwards. So you guys were were the, uh, the wall supplier, but interesting here where you've had some really tall walls and then, you know, regular ones. So do you want, do you want to just talk about this project and its complexity? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a fairly complex project. It has the best, the, the best base for a prefab project is a level flat uh, concrete wall. This had multiple steps in it, multiple pony walls, and then different steel. So trying to coordinate that all was uh, fairly difficult, but I would argue that it'd probably be even more difficult if you were stick framing it. But then we did take, we within the model, we tried to make the panels as large as possible because if one panel is easier to move in than three multiple ones. Um, so we took the opportunity to do, to do some taller walls here. Uh, we're constrained by the trailers that we use. So we're kind of in the 11 foot wide by about 36 feet uh, length. So we will try to maximize that as much as possible, but there's a great opportunity to do some tall ones here as well. Um, so again, here's another view with, again, a little bit of the snow melted in the, in the roof on. Um, again, nice that the general contractor closed up the the uh, the building so they can work in a bit more warm warmer spot than it is but uh, before we dive into this um, can you also comment David and again I mean I'm putting you on the spot because I know the answer but um, can you just tell everyone the benefits of what your client did with this particular project compared to the neighboring houses that are still plugging away in the snow yeah well for a couple of different reasons we started a bit late on this project and for another couple of reasons we took longer than we expected but we still did it in 19 days and there's several neighbors around there who had started 12 weeks before us and still hadn't got framing finished there's no membranes or insulation and we saw them tenting and tarp trying to tarp the roof while it was snowing 
so there's you know huge amount of benefit to having the guys the crew in there now they're kind of framing out uh the interior they're nice and dry um i think anyone would want that and then the, just the overall quality of the envelope is going to be maintained as opposed to this kind of drying out that you see so common in all of these other stick built uh, projects um and for those that are joining us um if you didn't catch last night's event um, i preloaded that question for dave because i really love prefab and i'm hoping to get everyone who's listening to start to be open to prefab and you know as i said last night ted benson talks that the prefab is here to enhance the craft of home building it's not going to take away jobs we already have uh, a skilled um, tradesperson shortage so this opportunity is to help scale the industry and allow you to do more projects per year with really the same amount of staff. And so if yeah. you can't find people, prefab is a, is a great opportunity here. And um, we've got Dave tonight just to dive into some of the details of how this works out. And wanted to talk about this complexity because here you've got, you know, again, a bedroom over an open space. You've got steel, like I see massive thermal bridges. You know, what's now the plan for the general contractor to reduce that complex again this isn't a passive house this is a high step code sorry step five but i know this was um brought up in your design of of what they could do afterwards to reduce this uh these thermal bridges so i've got this picture and you can see the other side of the house where again the steel structure so i wanted to kind of dive into this detail a bit yeah i mean being an architect this is just a symptom of being an architect where you want to do these kind of cool floating uh floors, but they unfortunately do necessitate spray foaming to the underside. So the, the floor panels there, we would leave open. And that was just a decision that had to be made because there's not many other ways to ventilate um, that floor. But our floor panel can be left open. Uh, and then the insulation would wrap around, the contract would install insulation against that steel and then wrap the membrane down and round. Um, so yeah, this was a, a fairly tricky detail, but again, um much easier to kind of work out in the computer model rather than kind of hovering and installing that floor you know above you um so here's interesting again you've got your walls you you've made the steel beam that's over so this is um a detail in um in the project um david so it's uh, when i was on the site last week this is a photo i took and so you've got your walls tying into a steel beam then you've got the trusses into it um yeah. and so just to kind of talk about the complexity of how this gets designed and then sent off to the different trades and then what gets included in your scope of work. Yeah, we've, we've had some issues with kind of overlap um, because they're, and, that, and that's kind of been why we've um, gone to having someone else now just as a part of the tag panel quote, model all the steel so that we do have it uh, fine, like, you know, finite in our model. Um, but there was a bit of crossover here with the general contractor and ourselves having to kind of both pack out steel to allow the trusses to be landed. And again, from a purely prefab ideal project, we would always want to prefab the roof uh, because it's again removes one other layer of someone else coming in and you know either having a problem or there being differences. So, but, but this design just was required to have a truss roof. So the trust company land, landed their trusses the next day after the roof was finished. But yeah, fa fairly complex detail, not ideal from the complete world of prefab, but it's all manageable. Great. So again, just to come back to the, uh, if, you're, if you haven't been into too many high performance or passive houses, here again, you can see the, this long walk, uh, sorry, hallway where the plywood is the interior air barrier and the vapor control layer, it's taped at the bottom. And then the membrane on the outside right now, it's just flopped over, but that'll get cut back and then taped to the ICF so that uh, it's a WRB and an exterior air barrier. So, um, and uh, yeah, I know I was up there cause they need more tape. Are you, see, are you like in, in this whole role, you know, the, the prefab, I think is being enhanced because you're doing multiple layers and you're providing more service. Um, how are some of the trades, you know, reacting when they're, you know, you're also teaching them in some cases when you provide them the panels, you're also now teaching them some of the passiveness principles. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this general contractor here is a great guy, um, but maybe hadn't um, 
hadn't come across some of the tapes and the, and the detailing here. So it's all kind of like a rising tide lifts all boats, you know, if we can kind of get them interested in how that tape works and how the windows will be installed. Um, the client went with some pretty nice windows on this. So we'd be really interested to see after the fact and with the GC having the knowledge now of these tapes and how to put them together, what this blower door test uh, will come out at. So um, I think everyone gets pretty, ex you know, there's a little bit of a kind of, oh, it's not the way we've always done it, but I still am really positive that a lot of these guys, when they actually see it going up and they see it go up in 19 days and they see the quality and they stand inside and it's, you know, a sound insulated and a very you know, thermally insulated wall, it's, uh, they see that this is the kind of, you know, the way it's progressing. Um, again, this, I think this was a photo of your first passive house project, if I recall. Yeah, this is the first like fully passive that this one will become certified. Um, yeah, this was a Larson Trust system. Um, again, we fairly, we got a lot of complex ones <laughs> straight up. Um, this required us to do all the blue line because the architectural design, a lot of the roof and then the panels were supported on an exoskeleton of glue lands. Um, so again, when you talk about that overlap between who's doing what, um, it, we kind of had to take on that role because we had to ensure that, you know, we got all the glue lamps CNC, uh, so they would be exact and then they would be installed by our crew to then allow other panels on. Um, and this one's got an interesting TGI insulated roof, which we did. And then we framed a two by 10 cold roof as panels and, uh, installed that over for your ventilation cavity. No, very cool. Um, let's turn it over to Kevin and Mark. Do you guys have any questions? I'm going to stop the share my uh my first question as a as a cellulose nerd and uh contractor is uh what, what machine are you guys using uh in, in your in your shop to do dense cellulose and what method yeah we we have a crandall machine um it's uh i don't know the exact model but it's great because it can do cellulose and the knof uh i don't, never know how to pronounce that but the knof uh jet stream does anyone know how to pronounce it knof <laughs> no? Oh, Marcel's going to say, Marcel, you'd probably be. Yeah. Knauf. What's it? Knauf. Knauf. I need to put more emphasis on it. All right. Knauf. It does Knauf and cellulose, which is great because we, our primary objective is to use sort of sustainable and uh, carbon sequestering products, which the cellulose does do. But in some of the opportunities where we have to do a thinner wall panel, but get a higher R value, we've elected to use the Knauf uh, there. Um, but it's a great machine. We actually get a lot of people asking us if they can borrow it and put it on the back of a truck and take it to their site because the ones from Rona are about the size of a dustbin and this one's about half the size of a room, but we haven't taken them up on that yet. <laughs> Don't land hey, any. Is there a comparison to the Knopf and the cellulose weight wise, right? Because the, the weight of your panels are substantial. And then uh, I have a setup for Kevin after that, David. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so again, that's another reason why we, we we're kind of veering on some projects to the Knopf because these panels are getting, we're trying to make the panels as large as possible. So we're getting up to kind of 36 foot by 10 foot panels. And we've got a three ton gantry crane, but then we're the load of these panels then to crane them in. We're finding, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's substantially lighter to use the Knopf. Um, I then I then have the other problem. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the sound impact differential is. Um, we certainly on the one Worcester project that you saw earlier, we went with the cellulose because it is a denser wall, so um, much better sound attenuation. So to nerd out and get technical, the Knopf product, all uh, loose fiberglass, gets blown in at two point two pounds per cubic foot, uh, and cellulose needs to be above three and a half pounds per cubic foot. So if you had a twelve inch wall. Each one of those is going to be, you know, about a pound or so different or so. Yeah. And we, we really find the cellulose was very dusty, like incredibly dusty to use. And the Knopf wasn't dusty, but then we're also not stupid. We don't know if that we just can't see the dust <laughs> that we're breathing in. Um, but, that, you know, the factory certainly gets fairly dusty when you're blowing that cellulose in. David, there's a few nozzles, really cool nozzles out there available by XFlock and they're mm -hmm. ventilated rotary nozzles and they have one that does large panels like you're sticking your tube in 
I'm, uh, I'll send that to you. It's, re it's a really cool process and uh, it eliminates the dust of the in cellulose install process. Yeah, perfect. With the, with the technical on that, uh, we have a we have a, a a construction tech coming up that's about this insulation. But while we're on it, and since this is just brought up, Kevin, can you give everyone the background on how one would attempt to test the density and how how they should go about doing that if going after a cellulose fill? There's a few ways to measure density. One is uh, based on the volume. You know the size of your panel or your wall, and then you know how many bags it should take to cover that surface area. Like a standard two by four wall, uh, it, you know, eight foot, every three bays should be one bag. That's one rule of thumb. I, our passive house walls and our brownstone retrofits, they, uh, the spacing is, is it four and a half to five inches with the, the walls. So we measure the density with a core sample. We'll take a dryer vent, we'll stick it in, we'll take a core and then we'll, we'll measure and weigh the grams and it will write down our pounds per cubic foot. And the reason it's so important to measure the density is that over time that the cellulose in that wall won't compress and, uh, and, 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 and settle, that you would see the infrared picture of the settling at the top. Uh, so that's what, that's a good, good way to do it. And there's plenty of ways that are out there, but that for us, that's the most scientific and uh, it helps you calibrate your machine too. We, 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 do, we, we do a smart way and a dumb way. We do, we do both. The smart way is we take a core every fourth stud to ensure that we're getting the thickness. The dumb way is that we only order exactly the amount that the CADWORKS model says that we need. And then if we have any bags left at the end, we know we've got a problem. They're both smart ways, my friend. They're both really? smart. <laughs> smart and simple, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess quality control comes in different forms. As long as you're doing it, you know, at least you can verify things. All right, uh, I've actually had to call upon Zach to be the question concierge uh, today because I couldn't see the chat while I was presenting. So Zach, what do we got going on for questions so far? Well, I'm very happy to be able to guest as the, the concierge, so thank, thank you for that, Sean. So our first question is from Julie Blazik. Uh, Julie, you had a question about financing. Do you wanna unmute yourself and fire away? Yeah, so the question was, how did you get the financing to get the company started? Uh, boy, if we find some money under a rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there are rainbows and whistlers, so that's not surprising. Yeah, no, um, the, having, you know, the three partners, we've all started businesses before on our own. Um, so it was actually a really nice experience to start another business with partners. It shared a lot of the stress. Um, we all made an initial investment into the company. Um, and then we've just really grown. We tried to grow as organically as possible. Um, we had to take a, a loan out for the gantry crane because those are 75 grand. Um, but everything else has just grown organically. Um, and we're very fortunate, the location that we're in and the, the sort of various clients that the three of us have, it actually feeds the business quite a lot. So uh, we're not str struggling. Uh, we don't have some of the problems of like a struggling startup. Of course, we have a lot of other problems, but uh, the work isn't the, the problem. <laughs> and, and Zach, let's just pause for a second. Uh, again, we've, we've got to get some sneak peeks into Dave, David's company. And, and so, like I said last night, we need to celebrate more. So cheers to you, Dave, for your putting all this thing together, you and your team. Cheers to everyone else for joining us tonight. Yeah, cheers, guys. Indeed. Okay, so Harvey, you had a couple of questions. Yeah, I think you answered one. I'll just, and maybe you may want to just go through it, but I'll, I'll, answer, I'll ask two. The first one was, um, are all your carpenters um, like Red Seal or are they trained or journeyman or apprentice? Um, that was question number one. I think you sort of hit on it. And then the other one was just um, cost per square foot. If you had to take your number and compare it to, let's say, a, a conventional build up, are you more expensive or are you right on or are you less money? And also, I guess it factors in how long it takes for you uh, from uh, cradle to grave to get this built. So I'm just curious uh, comparisons and how people are reacting to your product. And by the way, great presentation. Yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah, first question. Um, we, uh, they're not all Red Seal carpenters. We have a um, uh, kind of shop manager, um, a project manager, an install manager, and we have various carpenters on the shop floor. Um, we've uh, you know, everyone's come from a background where they're maybe just framers. Um, so there's been a lot of education, you know, people like Sean have come and sort of, you know, explained 
uh, tapes. And as I said before, I think, you know, there's, I have a huge amount of faith in like these guys just, they want to do better. They don't want to just go to multifamilies and get told they have a square foot price to frame and they have to get out of there as quick as possible. They do take care in their work. So it's been really exciting to see that progression. I remember when uh, Sean came around to give us a demonstration of one of the sill uh, gaskets, the guys were all touching it and we were inside, it was January and it was snowing outside. And the guys said, you know, well, this is great, but what temperature can we install this down to? And we had to say, guys, you never need to worry about that again. You're, it's 23 degrees in here, you know, seven days a week, it's fine. So there's a good kind of uh, learning phase for them. Um, the price per square foot we've got, um, because we get asked so much, we've come up with some historical data where our square foot price based on the actual floor plan square foot is b between the 55 and $65 a square foot range. Um, we use that as a kind of an example to send to um, contractors. Um, what are one of our biggest struggles and maybe some of the other passive uh, prefab guys is, will have this as well as trying to do this apples to apples comparison. We've had a lot of guys come in and say, you know, like, you know, the panel project, panel price is 140 grand for a house. And they'll turn around and say, that's crazy. I can frame a house for 40K. And we have to say, well, how much is your insulation and how much is your taping? And then how much delays will you have? And how many, how much carrying costs does the client have? You know, if they're paying five grand a month mortgage on the land and it's going to take you four months to frame. And, and we've, a lot of guys have a lot of details of their pricing and historical pricing from a contractor point of view, but we still to this day, we've done 30, 35 tours through our factory with contractor teams and not one of them has actually been able to give us a kind of, here's exactly what my exterior envelope and costs at the end of the day compared to what your price is. So our struggle is that we're, we're always seen as a kind of higher headline price. Um, but I think more and more the contractors are coming to us just saying, we've just been hit with eight jobs this year. We've only ever done five. We need a different approach to this. Or more commonly in Worcester and Pemberton, I only have a crew of four guys and two of them are going skiing for this season. <laughs> How are we going to put together all these houses? So it's, a, it's at the same time a kind of performance, but it's also kind of helping some businesses expand. But well, I guess if, I guess the, my thought would be if you would talk to a, a, a GC who you were close with after they did the complete build out and then back out the number that mm -hmm. of what you've done and that may be a way of getting some really good real time numbers for you to be able then to compare. Then the other side is that I know on a renovation I really get very granular and I'm surprised that no one can really come back and say well here's our insulation here's our our vapor uh, retarder, here's our weather barrier, here's how much it's going to cost. That, that actually kind of surprises me that they don't have that uh, those numbers in advance. But anyway, yeah, thank yeah. you. Thanks for the answer. Yeah, and just and just to clarify, most of them can say, here's my line item for insulation and here's my labor. But what they can factor in at the end of a project is I had an electrician come in and they slashed a bunch of poly and the insulation was done. And then I had to send two guys in to kind of fix that, which caused a delay in getting the plumbing, you know, so there's there's all these other knock-on factors that sometimes the contractor would just rather forget at the end of the day, and they don't they don't roll into their next uh, budget. But um, yeah, yeah, I guess that 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 always adds adds into your general labor uh, stub of number that you can use as your uh, your internal uh, contingency. Thanks, yeah. thanks, David. Great. Nice. All right, thank you. So the next question we have is from Justin's iPhone. Justin's iPhone, are you here? <laughs> hey, uh, <clears throat> I just had, well, I think my original question was answered, um, but uh, I had a question about <clears throat> what you're including in your in your package there. So it seems like you're trying to, to leave your sites with uh, the shell completed, but I noticed that you don't have uh, windows or doors installed. Could you just talk about why why that decision was made, or I don't know if you're planning on maybe trying to include that kind of stuff in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Our main market at the moment has been sort of custom houses and the variabilities and the sort of time required by a client to purchase the windows has been a, a, a bit of a, a sort of 
tertiary factor that we can't kind of pull into the model at the same time. Um, we've chosen not to include them as well just because of shipping. Uh, we currently ship everything flat. Um, so we'd have to have different trailers to ship them standing up. Um, we are pricing multifamily at the moment and the multifamilies will have a much more uh, regimented wall panel with maybe two openings that are exactly the same. And we will be installing the windows not in the factory, but we will be delivering them to site and then standing the wall up, the crew will install the windows and then they'll get craned into place. Um, yeah, I have seen plenty of other, I've seen plenty of examples of uh, the windows being installed in the panels, but some of the houses we're certainly doing at the moment, the window package could be a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars and we just don't want to take the risk of shipping that panel and something happening to it with the window in it. Great. So we have a few questions from Scott Kennedy, who is oh, our, one of our two guests at tomorrow's happy hour, by okay. the way. A oh, couple questions. Uh, one of the ones, if you were doing a multifamily building, would you be framing the interior partitions as well? Yeah, depending on the size, um, certainly on all the projects we've done in, at, the, at present, we frame all, all of the interior load bearing walls um, and deliver them to site. On one of the projects we're doing in Burnaby uh, in January, by the time we framed all the shear walls, there was maybe 30% extra interior walls. So we just had the contractor ask us to frame those up prefab and install them. Uh, on the multifamily that we're pricing at the moment, the client really wants to just go full prefab, which again is kind of where, where we're at with this system. We don't want it to be a half just doing walls and having trusses land on. So uh, yeah, we're gonna be doing all the interior walls for those jobs, pricing those out. And how 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 tall are you? Are you going six story, five story? Uh, that this one that we're pricing at the moment is five story. Okay, so I've got a ninety five sweeter. I'll talk to you about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's the first. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, this is a hundred and fifty unit one, which is okay. Pretty good. And Scott, since you announced it on the accelerator, you realize you have to give a cut to Mike, right? Because you kind of got us in the deal. So. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure we can find some money for accelerator or something anyway. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, so cheers. Best best meeting ever. <laughs> hey Mike, I gotta pull you in somehow, my friend. You can't just sit there to enjoy the conversation everywhere, right? I mean it's so yeah, easy. You I, just, you I just think keep pouring and just it works. Yeah, I think I got a lot of my questions answered in the chat. Uh yeah. I was wondering about uh, other bits. So I think I'm I'm good for now. I'm I'm sure there's a things I forgot that I put in the chat. I always forget what I'm doing. So all right, thanks. Yeah, great. Thanks, Scott. So Al at Porchlight, you had a question. Yeah, guys. Uh, um just looking at I, uh, the training side of it, um, David, how often do you guys kind of plan like formal training with your guys? Is that part of it? Other than having Sean come in and do your taping for <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, with the, the speed that we've been growing, we haven't really had the, you know, good opportunities to kind of take a breather and have everyone uh, fully trained up. One of our objectives next year is to have everyone take the certified past uh, training right. course. Um, but the, the techniques that we're using are still, you know, they still have a foot in the kind of, you know, the knowledge that these guys have. It's more so the tape, the wood fiber and the membranes that we're yep. really the step up they needed to do and that's something you know sean and the other guys can can really assist right. with, but no but no kind of formal training other than that gotcha one other question um how many how many houses in comparison like how many have you done of a full prefab and how many have you done where you've just you've had to do the trust system on top and leave that separate kind of ballparking it is that half uh, half or no, there's only one that we've done with the trust, all the others. I mean, we've only been going for a year, so we've got six. So okay. we only, but you know, that would be the last one we would, we've, we've now got into the position where we can actually select the jobs that were, yeah. are better to yeah. prefab and the better ones to have the, the roof in, installed. Yeah, cool. Good for you. Thanks. And Al, I just brought in that project of theirs because I happen to be on site and up the street and so um, it just you know showed some complexity and I thought it was a good one to talk about how we can go from regular builds to prefab and make it work and and you know just letting people know that prefab can be an answer 
and and reach out to prefab because it can help out so it was just a good example to see how some of the complexities could come together and as we always talk about we're always talking about the technical the technique and the technology zach what else hey, you got? Sean, i have something to add to that uh Oh, go ahead, Kevin. I was just throwing up my tea for technical. Oh, I thought that was a timeout. <laughs> okay. So um, so that being said, uh, if you haven't looked at your calendar, we're, we're about to hit uh, another year. And if you're bidding on projects and you're already bidding them with your local stick builders or site builders, let's do everyone a favor and let's also bid them through the many prefab companies and panelized and modular companies that you found on Passive House Accelerator, because the comparison studies are not as known as we think they are. And, and the time studies and the productivity and the waste studies are known by many of us, but not by the marketplace. So if you're bidding a project or know someone who is, and you're looking for a prefab company to offer uh, a, another bid uh, and, and you don't know who to do that with and you haven't met them, this is what the audience is for. And Sean is asking uh, us that we bid our projects in prefab, just like when we bid everything else, we want competitive bids. So get that out there. Let's, let's look at the site build and let's talk about these advantages because most people here know this, but when we expel it, to the 92% that aren't here, that's when we have an accelerator. Yeah. And on the note too, it's great to see, um, we got Rain from Collective Carpentry here tonight. We've got Alan Gibson's from GoLogic. And if I can't see in the screen, if there's another prefabber out there, let us know. Um, because again, this is this whole thing about sharing the pie and we all grow. Um, and again, we're kind of diving down because I got to, to be closer to tag than I am these other two gentlemen, but um, you know, we need to share this knowledge and, and go through these hurdles of successes and failures of how these things are going to happen. And, um, you know, um, what David and his partners have done quickly and what they're up to, it, it's pretty impressive. So again, thanks Dave for, for, you know, answering the questions, Zach, back to you. Great. So Cameron Malpe, you had a question about foundations. Uh, yes, I did. Um, I'm just, I've never done anything that's been with the prefab walls before. And I'm just wondering how the interface between uh, your walls and the and the concrete foundations work. Do you do you wait until the foundations are in place and then do a site measure before you proceed with the building panels, or are you going to take it on faith that the the foundations are uh, the dimensions the drawings say they are? Well, in an ideal world, uh, we can base that off the exact uh, architectural drawings, and that's certainly what the entire model is done off, and the. Uh, shop drawings because that process takes about four weeks. We can't wait for them to be fully finished there. We will send a surveyor up to pin some of the corners uh, to, to give us a just a double check just so th that we're informed when we bring the panels to site the following week that everything's going to be okay. We have run into problems before where you know, we would pin the corners of the foundation and we find out after the fact that the foundation is back bowed. Uh, which right. is a, a little bit of a problem. Um, and then the interface, we actually, once the concrete is finished, again, we would be expecting the concrete to be finished very flat, very sort of uh, ready for a silt plate, which we would install underneath the, um, yeah, but that, that doesn't, again, sometimes we have to go in and we have to grind down a bit, uh, depending on the concrete, um, this adds to the days on the site. But yeah, we would install that sill plate. So we have a couple of days to set that up. And then the panels land over with kind of like a male-female connection down onto that. And then we have a pocket in each uh, panel where there would be a hold down strap that gets tightened. We fill that pocket in with rock tool and seal it back up with a sheet of plywood and tape it. But you, but you haven't encountered the, an issue where the foundations have been so far out that you've had to do any sort of major on-site mo modifications? Uh, <laughs> yes, we have. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering, because I've, I've experienced it with regular stick belt where there's been a pretty bad bow in a foundation. And if I if I had prefab panels coming, it's like, what do you do? And, and again, and it's totally reasonable. Yeah, and, and we'd all like to think that everyone's gonna have everything lined up, but there's yeah. some things that we just have to adapt to. 
yeah. we can do surveys, we can come out and snap lines and we can still find that some of the panels are not going to be completely lined up. Um, you know, pony walls underneath the crawl spaces can sometimes be higher. Um, yeah, that, you know, we would yeah. love to get that nailed down, but I don't know what the answer is other than okay. multiple, yeah. multiple surveys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. All right. Fantastic. So next is Susan. Great. Thanks. Uh, I had a question, but it wasn't really related to modular. So I'm, I'm going to give that one a pass and I'm going to go off script. And I want to ask about the, you were talking about how the window situation, you like to do that separately, but just wondering in terms of if you're doing a passive house and you're doing the blower door, how do you, how, how do you, uh, say who's responsible for air tightness when you are you installing all of the windows and are you then responsible for getting oh. that blower door test um, passing? No, the, the general contractor is responsible for air tightness. Um, we install all the panels. We don't install the windows. Um, but the, the panels are seen much more as a kind of product, much like the windows. Um, the windows will give you a required R value and a required tightness, but it's all about the installation of, of the complete package that will get you your overall uh, air tightness. One of the first jobs we did, the client, uh, we landed all the panels, the client put some you know, more cost-effective double glazed windows in, uh, just taped, and we got a blower door test with Mark Bernhard of one air change per hour. And so that was no tubs of cold or nothing, I was just in. Uh, so we'd like to think with some higher performance windows, we might get um, down to passive. And that's, again, not really trying very hard. That's just the panels coming out of the factory. It's not anything more than that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Susan. Uh, next up is Tommy at Char in Charleston. Yes. Um, great presentation. And thank you, guys. Um, my question is has to do more with the front end of things in, in the design phase and like when, what does the coordination handoff look like um, for you guys in working with architects, particularly those that are working with BIM? And is there, is there sort of a threshold where you sort of take over the detailing? Is, if, is, does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. So we would um, reach out to the designers and then uh, we would have a CAD file of each floor level, we would then draw up the model. And what we found again, being kind of on the architect side is that um, the three, we, we start, we do all our designs in Revit, and uh, then we get past, you know, this coordination between, between structural. But what we find is the CAD works model act, actually becomes the almost the live living referred to model, because it's had so much further input by structural, architectural and contract. Yeah. Yeah. That the the Revit model or the you know architectural drawings after a certain stage become almost obsolete. You know, there's so much more detail and and it's it's a set of instructions to build it in it in the purest sense. Um, whereas even the greatest architect coordinating with the structure engineer is not gonna get completely to that point. Um, so yeah, we we found the detailing and, and we found both all of those consultants seem to be quite happy happy to have this kind of like live model that they know is going to get built and uh, uh, that makes sense I, and, and I also appreciate your skepticism and in, in, in terms of architects coordinating things <laughs> um, well, I am an architect I can, I'm allowed uh, to say it. I, I, I totally get it I, I, it's a joke um, but yeah so is that some is that model then is is that like a live model that is shared you know in the cloud or something or how does how does that work yeah, we use a particular software called CADWorks. There's others out there, um, but the CADWorks model, uh, once it's built by the guys, they share what's called a WebGL link. And it's, you just double click on it, you open it in a Chrome browser and anyone yeah. can fly around it to turn layers on and off. And so we use that on Zoom meetings to collaborate, identify clashes, work out what we're gonna do, resize something. And then that then informs the, the shop drawings from it. So it's, it's really integrated. Great, fantastic. Thank you so much. It's a great presentation. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, so we're about to wrap up the hour. Where did, you know, an hour go? Uh, David, we, this is usually the time of our episodes where we always want to give thanks to mentors. Is there a mentor that has helped you along that you want to give a thanks to? Um, 
Yeah, well, there's so many. I mean, the, the whole architecture community in the, you know, in the city sky is all very supportive and very collaborative. And especially all the other prefab builders, I, you know, I really truly don't see any as competitors. I see it as the rising tide lifting all boats. And if we can just have every architecture job going out to two or three prefab companies for pricing, then that's, that's goal achieved. So really like to, and you know, hats off to them. They've done a lot of the hard work for us. You know, they, they've been in it for five, six, 10 years. So they've done a lot more educating than we've had to do. Um, so yeah. Thanks, David. Zach, you got some announcements? I do, thank you. First, I wanna say that all of our work at the accelerator would be impossible were it not for the support of our founders. So if you're enjoying Construction Tech uh, Tuesday or the happy hours or the summit or the podcast or the website, um, it's, it's thanks to these uh, fine companies. And I, we encourage you to, to uh, patronize them and, and specify their products and or their services in, in your work. So our founding sponsors are 475 High Performance Building Supply, Backstingui Architects, Mitsubishi Electric Train, HVAC US, RDH Building Science, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. Our stakeholder partner is NYSERDA, and our patron sponsors are Innotech Windows and Doors, Morrison Hirschfield, and Partel. Uh, I mentioned our podcast. If you're not already subscribing, we, we uh, hope that you will consider subscribing or checking out an episode. This week's episode is with Julie Torres Moskowitz, based in New York City uh, with Feet Nature uh, Architecture. Uh, she's an e educator and activist and Passive House Architect. Really interesting conversation that we had with her. Uh, tomorrow, the Global Passive House Happy Hour will focus on the work of Scott Kennedy and Gessa Zellerman at Cornerstone Architecture, specifically the Heights Project, which has been in operation for a couple of years, or a couple, yeah, a couple of years now. Uh, they, they're going to share some really ex um, interesting monitoring data and lessons learned. And we just saw their presentation. It's amazing. And you're going to need to hold on to your seats because it's probably the most fast paced presentation that we've presented yet on the happy hour. So please join us tomorrow. And next week on, on Tech Tuesday, Mark, do you want to talk about this one? Ian, uh, he's, on, he's on tonight. And we're going to have the six different flavors of timber. Uh, Y'all want to make sure you save the date for next week. Uh, and, uh, and it's important to share it with others, because who doesn't want a taste? of six different flavors of timber. So we'll see you all next Tuesday for technical, technique, and technology with Ian Robertson.